If it's small enough, I mean, I wouldn't always just assume an absolute when it comes to structural things, but if it's small enough, they're probably going to build it where they span it across. So okay. you got a good chance. Uh, you okay. can always tell what's going on in the top plate. If you've got a triple top plate, it's probably load bearing. And if there's a footing underneath it, it's definitely load bearing. <laughs> right. okay. uh, well, let me jump into this. So I'm talking about multifamily, jurisdictional, all these things here. Um, let me tell you a little bit myself since that's what it is. I'm a licensed architect. I've been practicing for 15 years in the city of Portland area. I probably have over a thousand different housing units under my belt, uh, from small scale up to high rises and really large complexes. About two years ago, I founded HVAC Studio with my business partner, Brittany, here. We do a lot of architecture and interior design, looking at multifamily and office space. Um, so these things are right in our wheelhouse here. These are a couple of our clients just to sort of check those boxes, but we've been around the block and multifamily and architecture is something I know pretty well. But let's dive into this presentation. So when I work with a lot of clients, I get pretty typical questions. Um, hey, can I add dwelling units to this project? Um, or the previous owner did some janky things. I think there's some illegal conditions or I have a code compliance. What do I do? Or I'm really afraid to talk to the city because I'm fearful they're going to force me into some sort of improvements. Or why did my building permit hit a wall? Or why do I have to go into design review? And those are all pretty common things. And it's about what do you look for when you're looking at a property or before you start a project. I'll give you some tips about what we're looking for and what the common pitfalls are. So here's our like learning objectives, but generally, I'm going to go through, like, here's your pieces. We're going to talk about zoning. We're going to talk about code stuff, and then I'll give you some tips about how to navigate. We'll refresh this in the back end, uh, and I'll flip my deck to everybody after this as well. So let's, let's talk about these guys. So Bureau of Development Services, they're our friends. Uh, they are the giant bureaucracy administration that all things planning and permits go through. Um, and they can be pretty frustrated sometimes. The flip side of this is that over the last two years, there's some really cool developments on uh, changes to zoning and to design review. So residential infill project, uh, better housing by design, and DOZA. And so really like, as of March, there's a clean slate for things how it go through and a new building code cycle. So a lot of things kind of got tweaked this last two years, but it all sort of stops and starts with the Bureau of Development Services. Uh, number one tool. So we're gonna dive in to zoning first because zoning really drives what you can do for your project and that plot of land that you have. So I'm pretty certain that everybody knows about Portland Maps. If you don't, it's, it's a wonderful resource here, and you can check out a whole lot of things. You can dive into that zoning section, and it'll tell you what your base zoning is, if there's any planned districts or historic districts, if it's historic resource. All the stuff is at your fingertips. If you're ever looking at a project, like this is your first start, uh, portlandmaps.com. And there's, there's a lot, lot more information that you can dive deep into it. But basically, zoning on Portland maps, that, that's your number one stop. I want to I wanna sort of stress this difference that we have here. And we talk about multifamily zoning and single family zoning. And they really are incredibly different for how the city of Portland sees it and different chapters and different requirements. We'll hear a lot about uh, kind of this RM1, RM4, and that was all driven by Better Housing by Design, which came out about January of this last year. And that was kind of small, anything small like R1, R2 in the previous, co the previous code iteration. This is FAR based, so I'll get into that. And this is code Better Housing by Design right now. The other side that addresses single family zoning, and that's 2.5 to sort of R7 is the residential infill project. I'm sure you guys have all heard about this. It's been much, much more contentious. 
It also tweaks to an FAR base, but it is not current code right now. But you notice if you go to chapter and verse, there's this multifamily zone that's tied to these zoning base zones. And there's a single family zone, which is tied to different base zones. And we'll, we'll sort of dive into the subtleties here. So I like to talk about what is FAR, which is floor area ratio, especially since all of our codes are going to be going back to um, are going to be going back to this FAR rather than dwelling units. So it used to be that you had a plot of land, maybe it's 5,000 square feet, it was R5, which means one dwelling unit per 5,000 square feet. You could only have one dwelling unit on that spot. What this FAR tweak does is it says, you can build as many dwelling units as you want, but you're limited by the amount of floor area ratio on that site. So if we kind of have an example here about lot coverage, if you have this lot and you have an FAR of one, then you can build one story, you know, two stories here, one dot. And that's going to be this big tweak we see. And that's on purpose to encourage more and more density. So this idea of flipping your basement or splitting units that was preventable two years ago is now all of a sudden in play. And that's why these triggers I'll talk about become even more important. One of these subtleties I do want to point about about FAR is that if your finished floor is more than four feet underneath adjacent grade, like a basement and all of these floor plexes we have around town, that doesn't count as FAR. So that's exempted. So you basically get free space in your basement. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy to convert, but it's exempted from your maximum FAR. And so what these codes did is they switched everything to FER, but they sort of like shrunk that overall window you could get. And we'll, we'll start to play with that as it becomes more and more uh, prevalent, as people get more uh, comfortable with the building codes. But you'll hear FER, FER again. That's why I want to talk about it and help you define it. So let's talk about multifamily zoning, um, because that's what we're talking about here. And again, that is this RM1, RM2, RM4 zones. And that is multifamily zoning. Um, and that would be like R1, R2, which you heard before. This is everywhere that we have better housing by design, which is now code. And you can see it's really about by design on corridors that are really popular. So like all the really hot spots that you want to buy multifamily. Northwest 23rd, uh, the Lloyd District, Boise Elliott, NLK in Mississippi, uh, on 82nd, the Kenton neighborhood, the Foster Powell Boulevard, like everywhere there's mass transit, and we can support more and more density. And you can see it all along here on this map. And, and you know, again, I'll flip this. But like, that's really where we're buying existing multifamily projects. And so then we're already in this multifamily zone. Um, we can talk a little bit about where this is coming from. And again, back to this idea of FAR. So this RM1, RM2, it's all about density. And that basically relates directly to what the FAR is. You can see upwards in like the RM4, that would be like a five over one. So pretty big scale. We usually are working in the RM2 zone. That's where a lot of where those corridors are. Um, and you know, you guys can dig into a better housing by design later, or if you haven't seen the presentation, that's another one here. But just kind of know, like, again, that's the scale that we're thinking and that the city expects you to see. The, the converse in that is the residential infill project which is a little bit smaller scale. So that is single family zoning. So ADUs, duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes. And I add this line here below duplexes because that's when you get kicked into a different code. And that really has very, very significant uh, factors. So we kind of look about where this single family zoning is. And it's really everywhere that isn't the multifamily zoning. And it's 43% of all zoned here in Portland. And when residential infill opens up, again, it flips it from dwelling units to FAR. So all of a sudden, like a quadplex or a triplex is in play on a lot that had single family. And that's a really big win 
for developers. Um, it's also to satisfy Portland's requirement for House Bill 2001, which sort of mandated that you have to have triplexes and quadplexes across the state. You don't have to get into those things, but just know like number one thing about can I add dwelling units? Know your zoning because that determines what path and how easy it is to add those units. There's a couple of cool things in here. Again, it's FAR based, there's some bonuses. Um, and they're trying to show you kind of what happens here. Again, like we should all be pretty familiar with this one, but you see R2.5, single family zoning, RM2, multifamily zoning, um, and the density falls. So if you're looking for a project, try to find those RM2, RM1 zones. Like that's where you're gonna be able to get the most density for the same footprint. So we come back to these guys again, the Bureau of Development Services. And what happens when you add new code changes is that there's a different expectation for one, a project is compliant, and that BDS, because they wanna have their planners, they're doing things, they keep moving the goalpost. And so something that was compliant necessarily five years ago, doesn't mean that it's necessarily compliant today because there's a new code cycle. And this is how you start to run into headaches and brick walls with the city. Their general rule is, if you touch it, you gotta bring it into compliance, and then you gotta pay them some money. So let's kind of look about what's going on and what's driving that. So there's this concept in the code called change of occupancy. And this is by far the number one trigger that's gonna make it add things to your project because out's gotta be basic scope. So when you say, hey, I wanna flip my basement, which is storage or communal laundry into a dwelling unit, great, yeah, that's a really good idea. The city's gonna come in and say, that is a change of occupancy. That you're taking something that was un uninhabited and turning it into habitable space. And because you've made that tweak, now you have to bring that project into compliance. Um, and it doesn't just matter about the unit itself. Generally, anything you build that's new is gonna have to be co-compliant. This brings into these other things that will happen. So change of occupancy is right here on the top. Um, they're gonna look at, is that building code compliant? And I'll go through some of what the common ones are here but that's that trigger that they get you. They're like, hey, you wanna add an egress window? We're gonna work on that. Or I'm gonna back check your parking. Or I'm gonna make sure you have enough outdoor space that your tenants can use. Uh, and those are kind of these triggers that you have, but when you look at it, it's if you change use of a space from you know, storage, uh, uninhabited attic, uninhabited basement into habitable space, Bam, that's when zone is gonna get involved and start talking to you about SDCs and compliance from a zoning standpoint only. If you're working on projects that are a little bit bigger, like 12 units, then there's this other trigger that comes in for permits over a two year period that's over 300,000 square feet. And we'll get that the next slide, but that's kind of like the biggest hammer to make you do changes. There's another one in the code about unreinforced masonry. We really rarely will see that in multifamily, but know if like you buy a really, really nice like former, I don't know, brewery or fire station and it's unreinforced masonry, that's gonna, that's gonna require more and more. So just in case it's possible so you have it for reference, there's this idea about this exposure cap in here. Then we have a site that's just not conforming because it's historic or it's really old and no one's touched it for 50 years, uh, the city can require you to spend 10% of your project valuation on fixing that site. That's not the biggest deal, but they're gonna make you document every single thing that's non-conforming, which can definitely cost you in some architect fees. And then they have a record on there. So just kind of know, like if you go back, um, if you kind of go back here, like this two year period, is $300,000. So as long as you stay under that, which is pretty fair for a basement flip, then you'll get out of that non-compliant items. 
So let's talk about what, what the things you really, really want to look at when you're looking at a project or you're thinking about this um, flipping uh, a basement or an attic or whatever you're going to do. So the number one thing is about building massing setbacks and kind of open space. And this all relates about how the footprint of that building exists on the space. Uh, this will regulate how far off the street your project is, uh, how tall your project is. Um, really, that's going to be an issue. Uh, but what you're going to get it is this max building coverage. What the city's trying to do is make buildings smaller footprint, but have um, uh, be taller at the same time. So you look at like this max building coverage. If you're an RM1, you can only do 50% of that site. And that's a pretty good one to always back check. Hey, just do a napkin thing. If we got a big project that's kind of low and flat, are you going to be able to meet this max coverage? Because again, it's this change of occupancy. So it's going to say you have to comply with the code right now. And if you're not, like, they're not going to allow you to build if you sort of violate these things. The other one you really want to check out um, is kind of the outdoor space. And I'll get to that one a little bit further on. So again, like your general building massing, it's not a big one, but it's always a really good thing to just check before you close on a property to make sure, hey, it's not going to be an issue. And that's part of your business plan to add dwelling units to that project. So hey, Michael, the other one is kind of parking. Yeah. Uh, can you go back to that last slide real quick? Sure. So it, based on this table right here, it, RM1 and RM2 look almost identical except for the you know minimum landscape area and the max building coverage i mean what's i mean what's the advantages or disadvantages of going with the rm1 versus rm2 and that sort of thing um rm2 is going to allow you more far inherently and so the rm1 is just a little bit lower zoned mm -hmm. um, and it's not something you can choose it's going to be set by the base zoning Okay. So you look at everything up and down Northwest 23rd, that's RM2. Okay. Anything a little bit like three blocks off Mississippi is going to be RM1. Okay. So if you have a, if all things equal, buy the RM2 property because you get more building, which means, you know, more paying units versus your overhead. Okay. But it's not something you get to pick. Yeah, yeah. When you talked about uh, a four feet yeah, yeah, yeah. under the um, kind of the the hat, like the ground zone, it sounded like, and that does not count for your FAR, but it's hard to convert. I assume when you say convert, it's, it's hard to make that a habitable space. Is that what you mean? It's easy from a zoning standpoint. It's harder from a code standpoint. Okay. And so you got to look for other things like head clearances and egress. And I'll, I'll get to that when we get to code. Okay. But that's a slam dunk from zoning. And again, it's like in BDS, these guys don't like to talk to each other. And I don't really care if they correspond. So, but as, as design professionals and the owners, we got to kind of bridge both. Gotcha. So the next thing I want to kind of talk about is parking. For a long time, there was required minimum parking for housing. Uh, all single family houses have to have parking. And that was just a thing that sort of drove a lot of stuff. Multifamily, because they aligned it along transit corridors, doesn't need parking anymore. And that's not popular with the neighborhood, but that's the code. It was a conscious decision by Mayor Hales to like, get more housing out there. The challenge is that when you have one of these triggers, the change of occupancy trigger, everything outside that site has to be co-compliant. So what you'll see is you'll have some existing parking that's been there on site. And usually it's this like little half driveway and curb cut that's been in this historic property and has a lot of value to you that is no longer conforming. And so what the city will tell you is this is an illegal parking spot you need to abandon this spot and pay to close this curb cut, which 
which just sucks from like a from like an amenity property value standpoint because parking in these corridors are really valuable but that's what the city's going to tell you and so just know what you're getting into that you might lose some parking spots as part of uh, that pro forma that you're putting together and there's really no way to wiggle out of that one because again it comes back to you have to be compliant under the new code the other thing that's going to pop up is bicycle parking uh, you know, so it's big about bicycles and every multifamily unit has to have bicycle parking by zoning code. It's really easy to just pop in some hooks for short term parking uh, inside your inside the unit. That's that's a no brainer. That's like a $30 ad. Um, it's just kind of long term parking and outside parking that becomes a bear. They're going to ask you to put staple rack somewhere in your property and make sure it's clear, has enough clearance. That's not always a thing you can do. The only thing is you can pay in to that fund, but the city's gonna come back and like, we want a bicycle parking. And so this one's not insurmountable, but it's a really, really common thing for people to miss. Um, and then probably the biggest one that I think a lot of people are gonna struggle with in the multifamily zones is this requirement that every single unit, every single property needs outdoor space. And so there's two ideas of space. There's sort of private space per unit, and then there is common outdoor space as well. Uh, the private space can be a balcony. That one's really easy, but a lot of properties you buy are not going to have private balconies for your tenants, which means you're really looking for getting outdoor space that's shared. The challenge on that one is it's got to be 20 feet by 20 feet minimum. So now we're talking like this big footprint on your property that just that needs like something like a picnic table or, uh, you know, like some planting, something like that as a requirement for zoning. There's kind of these other ones that pop up like public improvements and street trees and stormwater mitigation and landscaping. Those are much rarer. I think the ones that really going to challenge projects here in the future is going to be this common area requirement and having to shut down your parking. Um, probably the, the biggest, biggest inconvenience that zoning can throw at you is a design review. So in like the most desirable areas, which is essentially central city, and those corridor and zones that really align very well with this multifamily zoning that came out. Uh, you, if you make an exterior modification with very few exceptions, you got to go through design review. Now, recently the city did a, a refresh of this that made it a little bit easier for smaller projects to get out of it. Um, but this thing will spin out your project more than anything else because it slows it down um, and it costs a good chunk of money for pretty little payoff. Almost always you're gonna to have to go through a type two review. Uh, this will take about three months and it's gonna cost you about 5,000 bucks. And the challenge is that you have to do it before you can submit for building permit. And there's really no way to get around it. And so you look at, hey man, this is right where I wanna buy multifamily properties because this is where the most desirable areas are due to infrastructure uh, and transit. And then they get, they're gonna get you with design review. It's not, it's not the end of the world. You just gotta know it's, it's not gonna be like a fast building permit over the counter. Uh, like you're gonna to have to do this kind of application. You know that because it's gonna, when you look at the zoning, it'll have this D overlay zone that means you're a design review area. What are some reasons really quick that might drive your fee up to like 15 grand? So this is not my fee. This is the fee to the city. So that's straight up what you're going to pay city of Portland to get me to do design review. It's probably going to be about five to 8,000 bucks. And what really drives that is uh, I have to draw more things than I normally would for building permits, like all the elevations. I have to write a narrative, which sort of addresses what we're trying to do and then leads the planner by the nose. 
And then really good architects, if they have experience, are going to be back channeling on your behalf and talking to the planner and negotiating uh, and sort of leading them to where you want them to go. And that just takes time. And so that'll drive it up. If it's the other thing you really got to do is that once you get into design review and you get that vested, you really need to know what you're going to do from an interior standpoint, not interior design, but from an architecture standpoint. Because if you want to tweak anything, you're like, oh, crap, I forgot this egress window, or I've changed my mind and we're going to do this bay window out here, you're going to have to go back to another type too. And so you're like, you just wasted all this time and money. And so you want someone with experience that kind of knows all right, I'm looking at the answer. I know where the pitfalls are. I can push through this design design review and kind of bring your building permit on the back end of it, so that you don't you don't get caught and you got to do it again. That that's usually the trapping for for like an inexperienced or a pretty cheap professional. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I want to show you here for exemption is, and this just got added in DOZA, is that again if we're in this RF, which is single family all the way down to RM2, which is multifamily, where the alterations are less than a $10,000 valuation, you don't have to go through design review. And essentially, this gives you like a back door to say, I need to tweak a couple windows here. I'm going to submit a building permit just for those windows so that I do that work and it doesn't trigger design review. And that was kind of like a carrot that the city gave back to smaller scale properties. So they didn't have to be burdened with, you know, $20,000 of fees to swap out a window or make a minor modification. So that's kind of like the new thing we're all looking at, getting that small scale permit in before your big permit goes. The other thing we'll get is historic review. Um, and uh, this is probably the biggest pain in the butt because it's like design review with a crankier planner. And again, it's kind of like all the hottest neighborhoods we want to be, Alphabet District, Irvington, Lads Edition. I mean, I, I would love to have a house in all those places. What we have is kind of individually listed properties. Those are this idea of like local landmarks. And then we have historic districts. And that is like a blanket area of neighborhood that says, here it is. If you're in a historic district, like let's take uh, Irvington here, you're going to have to go through a historic review, which is really, really similar to a design review for any little change you want to do on that project. And there's a couple of ways to game it, a couple of exceptions, but just like know that's something that's going to happen, and you're going to need an architect for that. If it's lower level and it's just like a historic property, um, you can go, there's like another back door, which is community design standards. And that doesn't require design review. But again, the lesson learned here is if you're in a historic district, you're going to have to go design review, which means like bundle all those things together um, and really think about the long run because you can do that and then it's good for a couple years. But just know that's this big thing. And you'll see it, all these bounds here. Um, there's this funny story that it, when Irvington passed their uh, dis historic district, they had to go through and declare which properties were contributing to the historic fabric of Irvington, which really was a way to basically say, we don't want development in Irvington. Um, and they, about 95% of the properties were historic. And it just shut down all development in that neighborhood and drove up the prices. But those 5% of properties were not contributing and they didn't require to do anything. You didn't have to do anything to demolish it. And one of them was owned by Ndamukong Su's brother, a uh, defensive tackle who played for, ooh, played for the Rams last year. He played for Detroit for the year Detroit before Lions. that. But you, Detroit, yeah. So he made a lot of money and he basically like, hey man, brother, I'm gonna build you a new house. Um, and they had this house in Irvington and that they demolished it and built the biggest, most modern house they possibly could. It's on Ninth Avenue. And that uh, the neighbors were really, really pissed because it was the first new construction in Irvington. But because it was a non-contributing structure, they're basically like, your house isn't good enough to be in the cool kids club. Uh, they tore it down and built whatever they wanted, and that was totally legal. 
I think they sold it immediately, but it was just kind of like a big F you to the Historic Preservation Society of Irvington. So it was like little things for that, but like, no, these are going to be harder areas to do projects because of historic review. Um, so, you know, I kind of think about like BDS as this three headed hydra. Like planning will tell you everything planning wants, building code will tell you everything building code wants, and then we kind of get this change of occupancy that people just kind of bumble in. And so it's about like setting up projects to, to know what's coming down the line here. So that kind of moves me on to code. Uh, this is probably a little bit more constraining, and there's two codes in Oregon. There's one of them, this Oregon Residential Specialty Code. This is all about single family. Now, when I say single family, I mean it differently from how zoning defines single family. The Oregon Code defines single family as single family homes, duplexes, row houses or townhouses, and accessory dwelling units. Uh, it's pretty easy to get through, like minimal fire rating, the stairs can be steeper, there's no ADA, the energy code is there, but it's a much lower bar. Like this is if you're gonna build a duplex, this is where you are, it's, it's really pretty easy and generous. The challenge is that there's no middle ground code. The other one is the Oregon Structurally Specialty Code, the OSSC, and that is everything else that's not in the residential code. And this means that triplexes, apartment complexes, five over ones, high rises, K-12 schools, universities, airports, everything falls under this code. And that threshold is as soon as you get a third unit on the same lot, you go under the commercial code. And that brings with it a whole lot more criteria. So like units that have like three or four have a disproportionate code burden, then complexes have 12. And I'll show you where we get caught up on that, but really it's like fire sprinklers, ADA, egress requirements, interior assemblies, fire ratings, a more stringent energy code. And even though zoning says, hey man, you can do a quadplex or a fiveplex in a single family zone, building code is gonna say, cool, you got through zoning, this is different. Um, and that's a really subtle thing that, it, that just always is a challenge. It's also this current fight about how an ADU is seen. Zoning sees ADU as an accessory to the main house. And there's all these things about what they wanna see it from a zoning standpoint. Building code says, as soon as you build, you add duplex, you add an ADU under a residential infill project, uh, Oregon code is going to say that is now a triplex. You're going to have to fire sprinkler all that, and and it's it's not very advantageous, but that's right where the code is, and so it's always good to know what you get into, eyes wide open. So here's kind of things that are pitfalls that if you come back from your building permit and say you need to deal with these things, uh, this is why. So number one is fire separation. Uh, you got to add a one hour rated fire separation between all of your existing dwelling units and certainly for your new dwelling unit. Um, that gets reduced when you have a fire sprinkler, but it's also going to mean like common areas, like your common laundry room uh, or common bike storage, you're going to have to add a fire rated wall. Now, that's not that big a deal for construction, like plaster will do that and drywall will do that, but don't be shocked when they say you got to add a one hour rating around this, or you got to do something a little special at that ceiling to make it a one hour rated protection. Can you, can you speak about what that means? I'm not super clear on that. Yeah. So, um, there's sort of like walls and ceilings. You can design them at different levels to last during a fire. So there's this idea that when exposed for 60 minutes, this wall will not, fall down until after 60 minutes. And that when you get into higher levels or more sort of risk projects, like an elementary school has much more significant fire ratings than a house. Um, but this is idea that you wanna separate dwelling units from each other. So if someone has a kitchen fire, you're not gonna lose your entire project because the idea is that the fire department will show up within an hour and suppress that fire. And so it's about protecting people's lives. Um, Usually it gets for like a one hour rated wall. It's your stud. 
and then type X drywall on either side. That'll do it. Ceilings are a little bit tougher, uh, but not insurmountable. But if you go from like a house that had no fire ratings and all of a sudden you add it and then they say, hey, change of occupancy, you need to make this project co-compliant, you may have to add fire ratings where there were none or prove that the existing walls have enough plaster on them that they're gonna do what you want them to do. So the other one that really is kind of a pisser is uh, sound transmission. There's a requirement in the commercial code that you have sound isolation between units. And that's really, really tough to do in historic properties or existing properties. Um, and so there's a little bit of balance, like everything you do that's new is gonna have to meet this. Um, but, and then the city's gonna want you to prove it. So for walls, there's an STC 50 requirement, which is sound transmission class. That essentially means you're gonna have to be doing resilient channels. It's not the end of the world, but that's what drives that. Floors are a little bit trickier. And so if you take that basement example, you're gonna to have to protect it from like people walking above, um, which means you're gonna to have to do a resilient channel and two layers of jip board to get that sound transmission class and then be really careful about where you use ceramic tile. And the city will make it, make it prove that. So you just know like, hey, I have this existing ceiling that was done previously in this basement. The city will want you to make sure, make you remove that and then make sure that it meets these like sound requirements. And I threw like the two most common one that I'll use. So here's that floor ceiling one we look at. And then here's this wall partition. This only has to happen where, where dwelling units touch each other, at the ceilings or the floors or into common areas. Uh, but that's one of these things that sort of drives it. Michael. So this is where the, yeah. Uh just going back a couple of slides, you'd mentioned that adding ADU, a third unit, for example, uh, on, a, on a lot that already has two dwellings, then Knox kicks it up into the uh, commercial code. Yeah. If, if, let's just say there's one existing and you add two detached ADUs, does that then still activate the fire suppression requirement, for example? So right now, yes. The city will see that from zoning, you're fine. Like residential will fail while you do a main house and two ADUs. Building code will say that is three dwelling units. Therefore, you're in the commercial code. Therefore, you're subject to fire suppression. Okay. Now, there's, a, there's an exception that'll say you can do fire suppression for the new construction only and not the old one. Uh, but yeah, that would be one of those triggers. You're building new units they're going to want to see it uh, fire, have fire suppression on it. Now, zoning's been pushing back and saying, hey, man, we, we have a housing crisis. These ADUs are a really good deal. We want to incentivize them. Uh, we want to be able to allow to have two ADUs in a house and then not go under the commercial code. Unfortunately, commercial code and that distinction is done at the state level. Uh, and anyone that writes a building code is going to be a, like a pretty cranky, anal retentive person. And so they've asked the question to try to make it happen, but the state has not allowed them that exception. Wow, brutal. Uh, and and yeah. so in addition to the fire suppression code requirement, the other requirements are going to activate as well, ADA and some of the other that, others that you've listed. Yeah, so generally the rule is if it's new construction, it has to be fully compliant to the current code and zoning code. Okay. Um, it, if it's existing construction, uh, like it's historic, you get a little wiggle room there. But if they say you're going from uninhabited space to habited space, so that change of occupancy, then everything you do in that new space has to be code compliant. Yeah. New build or changing, changing use. Okay. Change of occupancy, yeah, is kind of how they do it. Um, like if you can stay under the residential code, it's a lot, lot easier. But sometimes you just don't have the choice given how many dwelling units you have in that property. Okay, thanks. So we, the other one I point out here is minimum ceiling heights because this comes in play all the time for, uh, for basement renovations. 
So there's this rule, the city of Portland does not allow an appeal to this, that the minimum height for bedrooms, and this is clear height, is seven foot six. The minimum height for kitchens is seven foot O, oh, and that's the clear from the finished floor to the underside of the finished ceiling. Um, and at no point can you have anything dip below seven foot zero. And so what happens is you go in, you go into a basement, and they'll be like, uh, uh, you know, sewer pipes hanging down there, getting down to, to your sewer uh, outage. There'll be ducts. If you add fire suppression, that's in there. And so, like, always measure that height. Uh, if, it's, if it's, you know, if it's less than 7.0, like, you're going to have to dig out that slab, uh, which, is, which is doable, but, you know, pretty, pretty costly. Um, and, there, and there's really no way out of this because it's all driven by commercial code. Now, if you're in like a house and you're going to flip the basement into a dwelling unit, an ADU, the, it's a six foot eight requirement. You get a little bit more leeway in residential code. Like this is the biggest one that people just bang their head on. And you don't want to find this out in the middle of permit because you've already like spent all that money on design fees and uh, putting it into the city and all that time. So like number one, go to the basement, shoot a floor to floor, see where those studs are, and see if there's anything in the way that you got to design around. The other really big one is bedroom egress. So in the commercial code, there's this rule that says every bedroom must have a secondary means of egress. That means a window that's about six square feet and has a minimum clear of 20 by 20, or a, a well out of that basement that you can sort of climb out of, and it kind of looks like that. And that's a rule in bedrooms, uh, and there's really no way to get around it. Basements, you can always add, um, and that's, that's okay with design review. There's an exception for that, but you're gonna have to do it. And again, if you have to like open, enlarge a window that's existing, that kicks you into planning. So that's why I like check these things earlier. One of the tricks you can do is you can do it as a studio. There's no bedroom here. Uh, therefore, it doesn't have that criteria. Or you can do it like a one bedroom plus a den. Um, and then we say it's non-conforming. But this is one of these things you got to look at, right? If you're looking at the space, is there a way to get out of it? Particularly for attics. Like, what are you going to do for attics? You're going to have to add some sort of egress through the roof through a skylight. Uh, one, one question about that uh, basement yeah. egress. For the basement egress is... I, I was in a unit a couple of weeks ago that that's actually, I was in two and the owner said that mm -hmm. he had to put a step yeah. near, like right by that window. What, what's the requirement for having that step or is it required in all of them? So the requirement is that the bottom sill of that window is no more than 44 inches off the floor. Uh, sometimes it's higher than that. And the easy way out is to put a step. And then you don't have to lower the sill. So there's sort of, it's determined by the size of this window. Hey, if someone, if, can the fire department kick it out and put a fully loaded fireman in with his, to with his gear? That kind of drives this minimum square foot. Mm. And there's another one that if you open up the slider, can you get a 20 inch by 20 inch box out, which is basically can a person climb out in an emergency? And so those are the criteria you're looking, and then how far off the ground it is. Um, so that's all allowed. Okay. But that's what the step is. So that would be code compliant, assuming that the other things work. Yeah. And the city will like come out, inspect it, and make me show it on my drawings. Like they're pretty, they're pretty thorough on this. Okay. So the other really big one, uh, fire suppression. So there's a rule that says all multifamily and commercial code have to have fire sprinklers. And with fire sprinklers comes an FTC connection at the exterior and automatic fire alarms. Um, that's kind of a pisser. That's, like, that's a really big one because you got to put a second hot tap in. You got to go through your existing units. The nice thing about fire suppression is it should lower your insurance. And it kind of buys you out of a couple other things, but you know, not a lot of these existing small-scale multifamily have fire suppression in them. The city did add this code guidance, which is still in effect that basically says 
if you add new dwelling units, you only have to add fire suppression to the new dwelling units to count. They also allow you to do the lower 13R, which is the residential, than the NFPA 13. That's a subtle thing, but it, it saves you about 20% cost there. Um, there's really, it's really hard to get out of this. Uh, sometimes you can buy you goodwill with the city if you're negotiating something else, but just kind of know like, hey, I'm gonna add a new basement unit, they're gonna add some fire sprinklers. And then the last one to look out for is kind of ADA slash fair housing. Uh, this is only triggered if you have four or more dwelling units in your property. Uh, the full like wheelchair uh, ready with like the roll in shower, you don't need one of those until you have 20 units, but four is pretty easy to get. And that they're gonna say, there's an exception that if you don't have an elevator in your building, you only have to do ADA on the ground floor. But they're going to ask for you to be uh, ADA accessible in those units and then any shared amenities like your common laundry room or your common storage room are going to have to be ADA. Uh, that's not the end of the world. You usually see in doors and bathrooms and kitchens. Oddly enough, the city does not check for ADA compliance. It's on your stamping architect to make sure you're conforming. Um, but there is like an ADA advocacy group in town that'll go into multifamily, uh, particularly new construction of large, large scale, and then do their own assessment. Oftentimes, this is not with, that, with the permission of the landlord, uh, but it's a way for them to say, hey, I found uh, a non-compliant item. Uh, I'm going to file a federal case and say that I have standing. Uh, or you can make a donation to my advocacy group and we'll just call it a wash. So it's really about uh, limiting liability as a building owner. But again, it pops up as soon as you get four. For existing dwelling units, it doesn't really matter, but there's this 25% rule that's Oregon law that says you have to spend 25% of your building permit valuation on making your entire building ADA accessible. Uh, that's, I mean, that, that is a chunk of change, but then you also have to tell them what is not ADA accessible, which would be like going in and measuring and evaluating your existing kitchens and your door swings and all those kind of things. So it doesn't pop up that much, but it's, you know, it's kind of it's hanging out there. So, and like the other really big driver is like, know when you're in this code and it's three units. And just know like, this is what the city has you for. Um, and so like, think of that for economies of scale when you put these things through. So let's go back to these guys again because they got a lot of different ways that can make projects really inconvenient um, and kind of spin things out. Uh, but there are a couple tools to give you that they help you. One of the really good things that the city does is that they're actually pretty incredibly consistent from project to project in their enforcement of these codes. They don't, they're not playing favorites, you can't buy your way out of it. Um, so if you look at projects that have similar paths, you kind of going to know what, what's going to happen for you. There's a couple tools I really, really like. So one of them is this research request form that you can pay 15 bucks and they'll send you PDFs of everything they have in their hard copy file. So Portland Maps only keeps everything from 2012 on uh, and everything was done by paper ahead of time. So if you're trying to chase through, like, one was something legalized, one was it not, what was historic, this, ha this asks the city to give you what they have. It's basically a freedom of information request. Uh, it's worth your money and gold. And then you know the cards that the city has, and you kind of know where they're going to come from. Uh, unfortunately, the onus is usually on you to prove a permit history but this is what they're gonna back up. And so if you know what they've got in their file before you kind of start planning out a project, you know where the city's gonna come from and what your pitfalls or liability is gonna do. So again, 15 bucks, you can send it via email, uh, it's amazing. You should do it on every project you buy. The other one I really like is a preliminary fire life safety meeting. Um, and this allows you to get the city on record about how they're gonna enforce things. So you'll sit with the plans examiner 
and you'll sit with the fire marshal and it's always worth the additional 75 bucks to get the fire marshal there. And you can kind of walk them through your project. Here's my code analysis. Here's what I'm proposing. And they'll help you about, hey, just think about this. We're, we're going to flag that. Yeah, we don't really care about that. And if you have something that's a little bit difficult, you can start to negotiate with them at that time. Say, hey, I have this historic property. Um, you know, I want to do this. I have this one condition. I'm willing to write an appeal for this. I'm going to give back here. Would you support that? Would you not support that? And so for really, really tricky projects, this basically lets the city, the city was willing to sit down and say, this is how we're going to review your building permit without reviewing it quite yet. So that's another really, really good tool that I recommend really complex projects do just to get your questions out there um, and sit down with the people that are going to make decisions for your project. Uh, they also, also, the city will track that. And then oftentimes they'll take the building inspector who you met with or the fire inspector who you met with and then make them your building project uh, or your plans examiner. So the conversations that you had already and the questions you already asked, like you give them a running start and then you're not starting cold with the new person. And so that's even better because now you have a contact person throughout your permit or your design process to be like, hey, what about this? What about that? Um, and it starts to finagle and get your way through. So kind of like topping this off here, um, I mean, like here, here's the thing I would recommend to a client I was starting to work with um, or someone who's looking at a property. Uh, like number one, hire, hire an experienced architect. Uh, like early code analysis, walking through a project you're looking at, um, doing a permit research, kind of getting that out the way. You know, like that couple hundred bucks in an hourly fee to an architect is going to be worth its weight in gold to avoid additional fees or delays with the city. So like hire, you're going to need an architect anyway to stamp it. Like get them in on the front run just to take a look at it and let him or her sort of give their opinion. Sort of say, hey, did you think about this? Da, 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 da. Uh, always know your, your triggers. Change of occupancy. Change of occupancy or non-conforming, but it's almost always change of occupancy. That's what spins out the city. So if you can establish that this was already a dwelling unit or you're not really changing occupancy, then you don't have to be, and then you don't have to deal with zoning. So that can sort of set things up. And then like, look at what happened with other projects. The city is really consistent um, and you can kind of learn from their compliance journey. And that's probably what's gonna happen. Like the city's not gonna require one thing at one project and the second thing at another project because uh, they get their head box through the appeal process if they do that. So the other thing, like know your zoning, Portland maps, like you should be in Portland maps at any property you're looking at, know your zoning, and then kind of know what that zoning means. So what path are you under? Single family zoning, multifamily zoning, are you going to have to go through design review under a D district? Is it a historic district or a historic property? Because that's going to start to set the scale for how much uh, kind of zoning oversight and time you're going to need to get that part to the city. And then you're probably going to be under commercial code for all these, but you know, if there's a way to do it. Like a lot of times you do a split duplex, you do a duplex or you do like a, a house and an ADU, and then you'd actually split the lot and do an attached house and an ADU. That's very much to stay under commercial code because it's or under residential code because that's a lot easier to do. Um, Always check for your head clearances, like that's, and the only solution is digging out the slab or boosting the building up. Uh, digging out the slab is cheaper, but like, okay. Um, look for things, that are fire sprinkles there? Uh, are fire alarms there? Anything that you don't kind of have to build, like you get a, a, a freebie. And then just on your, on your radar, watch for ADA compliance. Um, it, it's not the biggest deal but it can set you up for a compliance lawsuit later on. And then everything new is going to have to be compliant or they're going to say there's 25% for ADA trigger. We're going to need you to modify a door into your shared laundry room or something like that. So I think that's the big ones here for the presentation. Uh, I know it can seem really, really arduous uh, and there's a lot of different ways to trip up. Um, there's also a lot of different ways to be successful. And once you kind of get your head around it, then there's ways to kind of back channel to the city and make things easier as well. So I think with that, I'll probably stop sharing.
Um, and let's uh, open it up for Q and A. First of all, Michael, thank you for sharing that information. I definitely learned a lot. Um, mm -hmm. on building codes and everything like that. I'm actually trying to help someone partition their lot. And I thought that was difficult. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm not even in the game. <laughs> um, but yeah, I had a question on going back to the RM1, RM2 zoning and the different types of that smaller multifamily zoning. Um, so if, if you have a property that's on an RM2 zone and I saw on that one slide that the building height is taller than in the RM1, is that typically when you can fit, like you can build a fourplex instead of, you know, a duplex on the RM2 versus that RM1 where you could probably only get away with two units depending on the lot size? Yeah. So it's going to allow you more of an FAR. That RM1 is going to be an FAR of like one to one. Mm -hmm. So if you have a lot that's probably 5,000 square feet and RM1, you can build 5,000 square feet of housing, um, which will get you, you know, that can get you probably five units pretty okay. easily. And then the RM2, you can get up to about eight. Okay. And if you have like a two thirds lot, you can get to 12. Um, there's also really good incentives in there for affordable housing. So if you give 20% of your units to affordable housing, it really tips the scale and gives you a, a pretty significant uh, FAR boost. Okay. And so it's really set up to say, if you, get, if you get like a clean lot, you can do a really, really efficient multifamily housing on those lots. And it's a pretty well-designed um, program. What I would recommend is, is usually when I'm working with a client, they'll say, hey, I got this lot, uh, you know, spend like four hours and give me a couple sketches about what those would look like as a new construction versus kind of a, a renovation. So you can start to get some pricing and see where you're going. And that's just as simple as a hand sketch. That's really, really fast stuff that we do on the front end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, I mean, I guess if you have a lot that has an existing structure on it, that's when that question comes into play, whether you should renovate and add to that or tear yeah. it down and go new stuff, right? Yeah. Um, and that's always just a study you want to do and sort of see what the numbers come back on both sides. The sort of halfway point is that if you, if you don't tear out one wall and keep some of the foundation, you can count it as a renovation and bank some of the previous SDCs, which can really, really add up in the city of Portland. So that's kind of like a hybrid option you can do. Okay, and then with that, if you, if you did go that option with keeping one wall and some of that foundation, are there still those triggers that we were talking about earlier that Mike was talking about in terms of the fire suppression and all that stuff? Yeah, like if you tear it down and you make a new construction, they're going to make you put fire suppression in it. Um, if you keep part of the house as like an existing house and you add a second unit attached to it, they'll make you add fire suppression to the new unit. They won't make you do it for the existing unit. Okay. But they're going to make you put a new firewall in between. But generally, like most of your costs in doing that fire suppression, the hot pep is a big one. The fire riser and backflow preventer is the other really big one. Uh, and then once you get that, you're just running a lateral pipe. Yeah. Uh, so that's, so yeah, you're usually about 80% there. Uh, probably the bigger issue is that it's really, really disruptive to run that stuff in occupied units. So you kind of want to wait until you're flipping the unit or something like that and you get some time mm -hmm. um, to make it happen. Cause it's because it's going to be a mess. And so if it is occupied, can you wait or does it have, to, is there a time frame that you have to get that done in? If the existing unit is occupied, you can wait and you can sort of put a stage to that and they'll probably give you about two years. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So just to uh, double check the, mm -hmm. I think you said this before, the fire suppression requirement um, applies to even detached ADUs, additional units, uh, when, once you exceed that, that three unit threshold. 
or immediate. Yeah, so right now they're going to say as soon as you get that third unit, if the third unit's new, it's going to need fire suppression. Okay. Um, I'm holding out hope that uh, residential info will be able to fix that for single family zones. Okay. But okay. right now it's not in the code. But you know, the, 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 the RIP program is still up in flux. And so there's a lot of things. It, it's now at a political, political place. So they would be able to address the state requirement in that city initiative of RIP? Um, well, that would address the House Bill 2001 that required multifamily projects in single family zones. So that checks that box. Uh, but whether they can get an exception or whether they can, uh, you know, essentially force City of Portland BDS to rule a different way from the building code, that's a different deal. Yeah. I think it makes sense, but right now they're just not there. And that could be a, we'll cross that threshold. A lot of times I'll put out these, you know, zone uh, planners have to like, try to figure out the language they write now, is it gonna get the effect they want in 20 years? And the big one is about creating more density in single family zones that still meet um, you know, the look and feel of a neighborhood. And so if it looks like no one's gonna do it because the fire sprinklers it doesn't pencil out, then that would sort of lead them, hey, we're not getting the goals, we need to make a tweak. Gotcha, but if it's in a um, something like an RM zone, Forget about it. If, even if you have a just randomly a single family unit, you add two more units, you're there's no yeah. belief there ever. Yeah, if you're in the RM zone, you're gonna do it. Now, yeah. if you keep it as a duplex, you wouldn't have to because again, that's the difference between zoning and building code. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. It's helpful. I, yeah, think, of I think I just figured out my project's gonna be too expensive to go ahead with. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, we're just, we're sometimes it right is. Now, so that's that's easy, you know, just spreadsheets. No, nobody's uh, picked up a shell, so it's good to know this. Yeah, and you know, like design is so cheap at the front end. Like you tee up the project, you make sure it makes sense, or you see like what do I need my rents to be to make sure this happens, or what kind of construction cost do I need, and then you just sit on it for a bit until it works out. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's what I do with developers of all scale. Cool. What have been some of your favorite projects slash like most profitable projects? I guess projects who were your most envious of the outcome. Um, man. We got to do uh, a new sixplex in Milwaukee that was uh, pretty tough. It was, it was about a half an acre and it just got changed to multifamily zoning and it had an existing single family house on it. And that, you know, we worked with the city of Milwaukee to say like, hey, we really want to keep this house. Like it's a nice house, people will rent it, but we want to add all this other stuff to the back end of it and have shared parking and shared trash and like make it multifamily. And that, it, like city hadn't done that before, it's pretty strange, but they said, yeah, we want to preserve this house too. And so they, they let us bend the rules a lot. And like, we had to go back and forth, we had to negotiate with them. Um, which was pretty cool. So to get it to happen was, was pretty amazing because it was a special one-off project. And then to design that, like, hey, here's a multifamily like, community with six, six dwelling units in total with an existing house. Like, how are we gonna make shared amenities? How are we gonna get that outdoor space to function? What's privacy gonna be like? Um, and how are you gonna make it feel? And, and now that it's built, it's a pretty tight little community. And like a big family lives in the main house, um, which is cool. They didn't make a sprinkle of that house but then the uh, sort of the three story multifamily in the back, like that was all up to snuff. That's cool. Is yeah. there a municipality in the metro area that you find really kind of um, easier to work with when putting up multifamily that's particularly accepting of it and um, just uh, easier to work with? Um, yeah, so anywhere outside the city of Portland, uh, <laughs> except not Lake Oswego, don't, don't, that's gonna be a pain in the butt. Okay. Uh, Milwaukee, I'm really hot to try it about. Um, Tigard, I think there's some really cool things happening in Tigard right now. City of Vancouver, they're a dream to work with. They're, they're really, really easy and straightforward. 
Good stuff. I think when you kind of remove city of Port- city of Vancouver, when you remove that zoning bureaucracy, it makes it easier. And when they just are kind of happy to have a project, um, they're much more willing to work with you and be up front. One of the challenges that we have in the city of Portland because there's so much bureaucracy yeah. is the, the junior planners, the junior plans examiners, you know, they're qualified people, but there is absolutely zero incentive for them to do you a favor. Because if they do, if they bend the rule a little bit, that's how they can get fired or get disciplined. And so there's no incentive to do it. And so by default, they're going to tell you no and then ask you to do an appeal so you can get to a senior person. Um, and, and, you know, if you know, if you've, been, if you've been through that enough and you know the senior people, then you can sort of negotiate with them ahead of time about what they'll see and what they'll accept. But it just becomes incredibly frustrating because they're like, by the book, default no. And like, hey, man, I got some special things. I'm trying to do this. We're trying to do the right thing. Our client's trying to do this or legalize this. Uh, and they'll just, yeah, they'll just say straight up no. And then the city was so incentivized for years to try to build multifamily, five of the ones, you know, like 130 to 300 unit apartments, that the whole system, particularly from the design and zoning standpoint, is for that kind of scale, like a 40 to $68 million building, which just doesn't make sense for, you know, a half million dollar project. Like, why should I go through that onerous process? Yeah. And so we got some tweaks with, Do- with Doza, but it's just not there yet. It's just not there yet. And it, it's going to need, uh, I think it's going to need like the big scale multifamily to slow down and that uh, sort of smaller scale, medium scale garden style apartments or six flex or quadplex you sort of pick up. Gotcha. Good to hear Vancouver is uh, cooperative. I'm, I'm actually uh, calling in from Vancouver. I have an office up here. No, I live in Portland and do most of my work there. Yeah. No, we like it. We've done a lot of the projects on the Vancouver waterfront. Okay. Um, and it's been really, really nice. And then a bunch of stuff, uh, you know, in the CTC area. And there's some multifamily there. It's just easier. They're just easier to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. You're going to send out your deck? Yeah. I'll happily send out my deck. I'll send it to uh, Trent here. Uh, and we'll go from there. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I. Mike. Oh, wait. Uh, we got one other question here. Um, sure. How about unincorporated Multnomah County with a Lake Oswego address, Englewood neighborhood? What is it like to work with them? Um, you got to find out what jurisdiction you're in. So sometimes, you know, that could kick to Lake Oswego. It could kick to Lake Oswego for building permit, but the county for zoning and then trying to figure out water or fire district, um, it becomes easier because sometimes they just don't care as much or just not as sophisticated. It becomes more difficult because rather than one stop shop like BDS, mm-hmm. you're gonna have, you have multiple jurisdictions that are all gonna want something a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and then Portland Maps isn't out there, so it's a lot harder to, it's a lot harder to find. Got it. Uh, Lake Oswego is tough because they have the Lake Oswego style, which is like, uh, it's kind of like Northern Italy meets Scotland. It's a weird thing, but it's going to like, they got their own little special sauce and they're going to make you comply with it. So you're kind of taking on a two headed dragon when you get into that space. It is. You just got to find the person who's making decisions and then just talk to them about the project. Okay. You could also be like, you don't have to commit yourself to talk to these guys. You can do about it in a hypothetical or say like, hey, you know, a lot of times I'll be like, I'm, I'm working on a project for a client I'm proposing. I don't have the job. Um, you know, what would this process look like here? And just kind of lead them through it. And they're pretty happy to give you free advice. 
So okay. you can say, hey, I'm looking at this property here. I'm trying to understand it as I'm putting together, you know, should I buy this or not? What is this going to look like? And then you don't bind yourself to anything, but they'll, they'll tell you what you need to know. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was, oh, wait, another one. Oh, nope. We got that taken care of. All right. Well, thank you, Michael, for your presentation. Cool. I was stoked when you said that you were going to be able to speak this month. And like I said, I definitely yeah. learned a lot and I'm, I'm hoping everyone else did. So I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Cool. All right. Well, enjoy the sunshine, everyone. You too. Terry, do you got anything mm -hmm. else you want to say before we wrap it up? Hey, those of uh, just uh, those of you that wanted your credit hour, you should receive them by early next week. And Michael, thank you so much.